This video is going to be a quick project breakdown of the last video that I posted, the Forge Dynamics in Cavalry YouTube short. I'm going to just kind of walk through how I set things up and my thinking behind it as well. So as you can see here, I have it split up into six different scenes. And even though it's only a 30 second video, I wanted to have things separated out so that there would be less keyframes overall per comp. And because I'm doing things where I switch from animation to physics, it just makes it a little bit easier. This first scene is pretty simple. Just have some text with the background, slides up, no big deal. So scene two starts out at the, the spot where scene one had slid from. So you can see that the background, it slides up and then going into scene two, background is exactly the same. So here we just have a shape that pops into place and that is just a basic animation on the radius. And actually, I use the magic easing quite a bit. Um, it's pretty good in cavalry. So this is just a small spring out. That's one that I use most of the time. Uh, so we have that popping out. And we just have a duplicator with a basic line. The line animation is uh, just the trim path start and end and then I just duplicate that around a circle get that nice little pop effect so next the array container slides in again just have some magic easing on there um, the hose just align with a trim path on it and then for these dots the color ones inside of this shape are just masked and I just used a duplicator sequence here this red ellipse shape is the base one and I just animate it moving over a couple of times and then I put a color array on that put it through a duplicator stagger the time offset and mask it so they go and then these white ones here uh, it's another duplicator sequence and it's pretty similar so here you can see I have just a white ellipse and I'm animating the scale just a little bit and then I also have a pathfinder uh, with the travel, animating the travel, and that is connected to the ellipse's position. And so that's how you push that along there. And then that is the one animation. And then again, just push that through a duplicator sequence so that you can have four in a row and stagger the timing so that it kind of fits with the, the color circles going off. For the main circle, I have uh, the hero array connected to the color and so here in the hero array I have the colors and then I just animate the index to change the color of the main one and then that just zips off and here it's just regular keyframes no magic using there next this little fax machine thing pops into place uh, this also has a the same exact magic easing as the uh, the array container that pops into place. These little shapes here are in a duplicator and right now I'm going to take off this is within so that you can see it. So I have this grid of shapes and they are parented to the fax machine thing. And this is just a polygon shape with a random on the radius and then a noise on the side and so they kind of pop into place. And so what I did here is I connected a frame attribute to the random radius's seed, and I set that to 30%. So about every three frames, the seed will change on the random radius to kind of make things pop in and out, bigger, smaller, like that. And their sides are just constantly changing with the noise. With all of that, I didn't want to mask it because if you mask it then some of these shapes would actually be like cut in half and you could see the shape of the mask so instead what i did is i used this is within so on the main facts dots duplicator on the shape visibility you can use an is within attribute here and this it's basically like a mask so here i'm using this fax beam as so you can see how this animates in and it's similar to a mask, except that whichever index inside the duplicate that is touching it will be turned on. So there's no cutting of the shapes. It's just it's either on or it's off. So you still get the general shape, but 
you see here that none of these individual shapes are actually cut off. So it's kind of a nicer way to mask if you're going to have a lot of shapes in a duplicator. And the fax beam itself is just a rectangle and I put on a flare and an align. And that just helps it get that kind of classic tractor beam shape. So here the idea was that this little machine here is faxing the texture into the ellipse. So I just have an image here and I animated the Y position with step keyframes just to make it a little bit more old school internet image loading kind of thing. And I just use the same timing on, uh, on each one. So for the fax machine, it's just the image and it's just being masked. You can see here it's being masked by the screen of this thing. And then it's basically the same thing with the circle. We have the hero ellipse, which is just the red one and the hero ellipse texture. And so and this is also just being masked by this square. And so the hero ellipse texture is in the exact same spot as the main ellipse. And then this mask is just coming down to reveal it. And then that animates off. And again, I'm just basically copying and pasting the keyframes from the first array thing so that they have the same kind of motion and feel. So scene two ends with just a circle in the middle and I just duplicated the comp and then deleted everything that I didn't need. So comp three just starts exactly the same. So there's a seamless transition there, but I don't have all of the baggage of all of those other layers, all of those other keyframes in my way so I can focus on just what I need. So in scene three, we have the little x-ray thing that shows that, oh, there's a stagger on the image offset. And so this is pretty basic. So you can see here, I have the hero lips and the hero lips texture um, inside of a group so that they move together. And I have these two shapes separate because I wanted the texture to be white and still have the color of the circle underneath. And maybe there's a blend mode that does that, but my texture is actually black. So the way that I found to do it is to just have, just have it be destination atop and have the texture ellipse base color be white. And so that's how you get that. So that's why I have two of these instead of just one. So anyway, the hero group, I'm animating the scale up and then it's just a hold frame. So this keyframe and this keyframe are exactly the same. But what I do is at the end uh, with both of this, so the, the texture ellipse also I'm scaling down the opacity so that we can see the text that's inside. And on these keyframes, I do a loop after oscillate. And so what that means is that it, the, the motion plays through like this, and then going forward, it actually just plays it in reverse. And so it goes out and in and out and in. And so that's why I have these keyframes that are exactly the same, because if I change this, this actually changes the timing of how long it stays here. So you can see if I move these in, then it zooms out faster. Um, so this is, I, I use this technique a lot if I want reversing animation. And you'll see it, it'll just keep doing that forever. So here on the stone texture, you can see that I've also put the uh, hero scale, the folder scale here so that the background scales up so that it actually looks like a zoom instead of just the circle getting bigger. So here you can see I have three different image blends. One for the inside of the color, just teal. One for the background and then one for the lines. And I have them all parented. I have the strengths parented to the inner blend. So I only have to animate one to change things to get that kind of x-ray look. And again, I just do the oscillate looping animation trick there. And then the last part is just this group where I fade in the opacity. I don't even do any of the scale or anything just to get these to come up. And then it's just a simple line with the trim path to make that little connector there. So again, this comp ends with the ball in the center. I just duplicate that comp, delete everything I don't need. So comp four, again, just starts with the ball in the center. So this scene took a little bit of work. Uh, you can see here, this is where the ball pops up and then it bounces in and gets captured by this thing. 
uh, there was a bit of back and forth animation here. Basically, what I did first was I just animated the ball. And so here we can take a look at these frames in the graph editor. So you can see I have a slight rotation just kind of animating this jump thing. And the first pass, I just kind of eyeballed it. And I wanted it to still end up in the center. So it starts in the center and it actually ends in the exact same place. Um, but I pop it up first and I'm zooming out a little bit here as well. And having the background move, right? Like if we turn this off, it, you know, you can still kind of get that feeling, but having all this extra stuff really helps with it as well. So the stone background helps sell that it's actually moving and having that first pop up gives me the space that I need to actually still land back at zero. And here I'm the first contact point is much further down, right? Than center, which gives me some space to pop up. And so here I just kind of eyeballed, you know, I wanted a couple of bounces cause I knew that the, the machine that comes up that captures it is, you know, it's going to hit there first, get a little bit of bounce and just totally eyeballed it. And so next I animated in the duplicators group folder. And so you can see here the position Y, if we look at it in the graph editor, it does have a pretty steep ease on it. And this was just, you know, uh, I kind of put in an initial movement and then as I was going through, like things weren't lining up. So it was a mixture of just going back and forth, changing this ease curve and then going back to the ball and kind of changing exactly where things would hit. So you can see that it's really just kind of tweaking things back and forth to get things to line up. And so we can see here inside of this folder, I have the main base graphic, which has a bunch of different things. I have the topper, which is this little lid thing. I have these other shapes that you don't actually see in this um, in this comp, but because I'm going through and my workflow is duplicating things and then just deleting what I don't need, I still set up this entire machine first. So there's even the cartridge that comes down later. You have the flappers at the bottom. You don't see it here, but it just makes it easier for when we duplicate and use it for the next one. And this topper here, just a very simple uh, animation. So this comp ends right here again, duplicate it, delete what you don't need. This one starts in exactly the same place. So this scene starts to get a little bit more complicated. We zoom out, we have the duplicators, we have the cartridge fall in, we have a blend sub mesh. So here, just zoom out, no big deal. Um, this is this here is basically just using the blend sub mesh positions technique that I made a tutorial on a bit ago. One has the grid shape and then the other has the uh, random position shape. And then I use this blend sub mesh positions node with the random duplicator in there. So as this animates back and forth, it changes where the positions are on there. Inside of the duplicator machine, we have the cartridge here. And so the cartridge, it just animates in and it has a pretty good ease here. So it starts out pretty slow and then it slams in. You can see here that last frame is quite a big jump. Um, I have just a basic line and it's just a trim path on a line that has um, a, a dash pattern just to give that little extra speed line. Here, this main folder has the animation for when it hits. It just kind of goes down and then rotates, comes back up. And so that is the end of this comp. And again, duplicate it, starts out the last one in the same position. Now this is the fun one where we actually get to the forge simulations. And it's a little bit tricky. So some things to take note of in the forge simulation that I don't know if it'll change in the future or if it's just how it is. Um, these flappers here that have the animation to drop the balls, um, they are actually bigger than this and they're part of a group that is scaled down. When you put them into the forge dynamics, it takes the original. So these shapes actually came in really large. So I had to 
uh, resize them. I, I designed this machine here in Illustrator. So I actually had to go back to Illustrator, shrink it way down, and then re-pull those in so they'd stay at the same size here. But then we I also ran into the same issue as the flappers where this ellipse uh, you know, was a larger size, right? It was it's the size of this ball. And then previously what I had done is I had just resized it in the duplicator. But again, Forge takes the true size of things. So when I first pulled this in, they all were humongous. So that meant that this setting this one up was really tedious. I had the right positions, but the sizes were wrong. So I had to go through and resize that. But then it also made the textures not being in the right place. So I had a lot of going back and forth. And I took like a screenshot to try to line things up. A little bit tedious. Um, but once you have the duplicator with all the pieces, it really is actually just what the video says. In Forge Dynamics, you go to Bodies, and you can see that I just have that base duplicator random, which is here, that has all of these pieces in it. You just pop it in, and then when you hit play, they automatically fall. And so it's it actually is super easy. So in our Forge Dynamics, you can see here that the ground mode is the composition edges. And so that means that when the flappers open, that they interact with the bottom of the screen and they also will interact with the sides here so they won't go out of bounds. But if you want anything else to interact with them, you have to define that first. So here they stay inside of the box and you can have a shape that acts like a container. However, I also needed that shape to open up later. So what I did is I just made a folder with some of these rectangles. Let me bring the opacities back. So you can see here, I made these four rectangles and put them in this folder walls. And in the Forge Dynamics bodies, that folder's right here. You click on this little gear and they are kinematic, which means that they will interact with things, but they will just be stuck there. I guess probably still could also work as well, but I had them set to kinematic and that works too. This just means that they will stay put and that they will interact with things uh, however you set them up, right? So you can change the bounce, you can change the density, all of these different settings. I'll do a full tutorial on the Forge Dynamic System in the future. But for now, you can see that they make sure that the balls stay contained within the machine. One thing to note is that even though they're in a folder and I put the folder in Forge Dynamics, the opacity of the folder doesn't actually affect the opacity of the shapes when they're inside of the forge system and anything that you put inside of the forge system um, it kind of gets duplicated so you can see here this duplicator I have it turned off because if I left it on it would just stay here so you can see that the forge system duplicates all those pieces for use in the physics sim but that that layer kind of just stays there right so I turn that off but with um, with the walls even if I were to turn off this layer here, each of these pieces inside of the group has been duplicated into the forge system. And so they they will stay visible. So that's why I have to go into every single one and turn the opacity off. And you'll see as I'm doing this, nothing is really happening because the forge uh, system doesn't doesn't reset unless if you go back to like the first frame. So now it resets with the new visibility on here. The last piece is the flappers. So these flappers have uh, animation on them. And again, just using that magic ease because it's actually pretty handy. It works nicely. I like the motion. Um, I typically don't have to tweak it too much. When those get pulled into the Forge Dynamics here, click on the gear, you see that these are also kinematic. And so what this means is that they will interact with things. They will be a solid body with whatever attributes you give it, but it will also respect the keyframes. And so you, you can see there that they move and they move inside of the physics system as well. So like if I were to take this flapper and move it to here, and then go through there. You see that that one's going to open first. They start to fall out and then that one goes. 
Um, so basically, kinematic just means that this object will live inside the physics simulation and it will do whatever the animation tells me to. Dynamic is what the balls are. So they don't have any animation on them. They just work with the physics. Still is what the walls probably should be because they don't move. I'm just using them as a obstacle. Kinematic respects the keyframes. And then kinematic hybrid, if I turn this uh, right flapper to kinematic hybrid, you'll see that it does everything normally. It'll open. But then as soon as you hit the end of the animation, it becomes a dynamic body. And so it falls and it interacts with everything as well. And we can still see it because this right flapper layer is on. So we can turn that off. So it's a little bit easier to tell what's happening. And so kinematic hybrid, you can have animations that then enter the physics system after that's done. Uh, I'm gonna turn this back to regular kinematic. So you can see it just does what it used to do. And like I mentioned before, these layers don't actually have to be on. Uh, if I just turn them off, you still see everything because it duplicates them into the physics system. And the last thing, if we look at the balls, you can see that I actually changed their bounce. So the default bounce is 0.3, but I wanted these to have a little bit more motion. So if we put this back to 0.3 and play, you'll see that they kind of land and they don't do anything, right? They just kind of like pile up and that's no fun. So 0.8 I found was kind of a nice balance where they're moving around a bit. And then once they fall and hit the ground, they kind of splash about a bit. Um, if you if you turn this to one, one I believe is the max, uh, things go insane and they never stop moving. And so, I mean, that could be also a good look, but not what I was going for. If you want to check out this scene for yourself, I do have a Gumroad download link in the description. Uh, you can check that out, support the channel, much appreciated, and I'll see you next time.